On this episode of the SBR podcast, we are thrilled and truly humbled to have an American icon join the show. This man's name is synonymous with speed and winning. To this day, he remains the only driver ever to win the Indianapolis 500, Daytona 500, and the Formula One World Championship. Please welcome Mario Andretti. Hi, Brian. Hey, Mario, how's it going? Wonderful. Thanks for having me on. No, thank you for uh, being on the show. It truly is a uh, honor, really, really to have you here. So my first question is kind of what I ask everyone, especially with COVID going on. How have you been spending your time during the uh, COVID-19 pandemic? Well, obviously, uh, many of my uh, normal activities uh, have been on hold, as you can imagine. Uh, but um, uh, I'm quite busy, just still in contact with the world, if you will. You know, we, uh, we do Zoom uh, events almost every day uh, somewhere in the, on this planet. So uh, from that standpoint, uh, you know, my, I'm busy. You know, my, uh, I don't just sit around and twiddle my thumbs, you know. But um, other than that, like I said, we just try to wait this out, you know, and, and, and hope we get through it, hope we get this <laughs> 2020 over with and <laughs> yeah, uh, we're almost there and, and start uh, understanding and enjoying what we did before. Yeah, that's I, I feel the exact same way. And, you know, let's go back way, way far back in the past, kind of earlier to your life. And having been an immigrant to the United States at the age of 14, um, I 15. know I, 15, excuse me, 15, 15. <laughs> I know that you had a passion for racing. But in reality, do you ever really dream that you would have a professional career that would span until the year 2000? Brian, uh, when you said dream, that's the key word. And uh, uh, I started dreaming very early on. It's, uh, you know, at the age when I just began to understand you know, anything about life. And um, uh, my twin brother, Aldo, and I just pretty much... Uh, had this so-called almost an impossible dream to pursue. Yeah. And I say this all the time, we, we never had a plan B. When we <laughs> arrived in the States, I think it was a blessing because uh, I think opportunities opened up immediately. Um, we arrived here on a Thursday, on a Sunday night, we discovered there was a racetrack <laughs> right here yeah. in Nazareth, even yeah. though we didn't recognize um, this type of racing, but it was racing. And uh, two years after that, um, uh, the, the only way to get started, Aldo and I and, and some buddies that we put together, we started building a race car that yeah. uh, we intended to race by the time we were old enough. And um, then two years later, it was car was done and we started racing at, you know, what was at the time, um, not the legal age. Um, legally, uh, to race professionally, you had to be 21. Uh, but uh, somehow... We got the license, the driver's yeah. license fudged a little bit. And uh, <laughs> so we started <laughs> driving in 19. And uh, yeah. that's when uh, my career started. And uh, it was straight through um, right to 1994. And uh, after that, after 94, I did uh, three Le Mans events. Um, mm -hmm. You know, actually, did 95, 96, and I think 2000. Uh, and then that's it, you know, but I uh, was, you know, one of the fortunate ones to, to sure. go uninterrupted, basically. I only missed two races out of 876 races, I think, uh, uh, sanctioned races. I had more yeah. unsanctioned, but out of the, all those races, I only missed two races because of injury. So I know how blessed I've been uh, and don't take it for granted. What can you attribute to that longevity? I mean, that, that decade after decade sustained success, really, you know, if you can summarize that. Well, success factor was a combination of a lot of things. Uh, obviously, uh, my passion and love for what I was doing and also uh, being able to be with the right team, with the right mm -hmm. people behind me. You know, it's uh, our sport is a very complex sport, you know, where uh, uh, you need a truly, truly a team behind you to be able to give you the tools uh, to perform and, uh, and bring back uh, the results. So again, that part uh, was a key factor. Uh, and the other part was uh, the luck. You know, I just, I was fortunate. I can, I can look uh, to my own family. 
my brother Aldo uh, raced for 10 years basically and uh, and two injuries took him out of the sport and uh, my second son Jeff uh, pretty much uh, was his career ended in 1991 or 92 was it? 92 uh, in Indianapolis uh, when I you know, a hub broke, a wheel came off, and and he had this, uh, you know, incredible uh, uh, injuries to his legs and all that, and uh, that ended his career pretty much. And Michael was lucky, very fortunate, like me. Uh, he had an un uninterrupted career, much shorter than mine, to his choice. You know, he, his objective was to become a car owner at, at a given point. Uh, but um, again, overall. Back to your question, um, a lot of it for me was uh, about just being lucky, being fortunate, being blessed. That's all I can mm -hmm. say. Uh, and uh, been able to dodge so many bullets along the way that, um, you know, just uh, still kept me active. And I have a question, you know, as outside the technical and tactical side of racing, do you feel that you personally, you know, had an, this innate ability to do it, to race? I've always been kind of curious with that. And, you know, athletes obviously have talent, but if you can go into that, you know, your work ethic and what you did to kind of cultivate who you became, you know, Mario Andretti. Well, like I said, the fundamentals are really the passion. You mm -hmm. really have the true passion and love for your pursuit. And uh, that's one thing that um, I had and I still possess in so many ways. Uh, but uh, uh, again, I, I was so thankful that I had the opportunity to uh, to pursue, you know, my ultimate dream for one thing, and then uh, and once I was there, I just never got enough of it. You know, I just yes. uh, I kept pushing the envelope, pushing the envelope, uh, because I just that's that's I felt that's my life. That's what I really that's uh, uh, that's my rodeo. You know, yeah. whenever I'm in a cockpit, you know, always. Uh, I just physically feel better. There's something about it that uh, that ad adrenaline really works for me. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just, uh, I had no interest of uh, cultivating anything else, quite honestly. I mean, you do things like, you know, you develop businesses and all that because, you know, you can't race forever, unfortunately, but uh, as a driver. Mm -hmm. But uh, I never had any ambition uh, like uh, my son Michael, for instance, uh, to field uh, a team. I had opportunities even to, uh, uh, you know, to join, you know, so, some other people in partnerships and whatever. But uh, that never, that was something that never lured me. And, uh, uh, and again, uh, uh, but again, the, just the love of driving is what really kept me going. And, uh, sure. and, and, and I, you know, when you're there, uh, you just want to have results. I mean, that's what keeps you motivated. Um, and uh, you never let up. I mean, it's, um, it's one of those things where when you're on that dance floor, you, you got to give it 100%. You know? yeah. So yeah. That's the way I looked at it. That's fantastic. And, you know, your advice to other immigrants who are coming to this country. You know, you came here at the age of 15. And when you did come here, um, obviously you had a dream, you had a passion. What type of advice do you have for other immigrants who, you know, might have a similar dream or even just maybe a dream to win a Nobel Peace Prize, let's just say? Well, yeah, I mean, no matter what your, uh, your desires are or, or your pursuits are, uh, I think this is a country that can provide those opportunities to, uh, uh, to make things happen. Um, like I said, uh, for myself, uh, uh, I, unfortunately, I didn't have uh, even the family factor to help me because my dad, you know, was, uh, was afraid of the sport, you know, he didn't understand, he only understood the negatives yeah. of it. And in those days, there were plenty of them as far as fatality. So uh, his protective sense, you know, was not to help us because in fact, uh, you know, we had to uh, race even the first season without letting him know. But um, the, the other part is, uh, again, no matter what your pursuit is, um, uh, this country, I think, is probably the only country on the planet that can really provide those opportunities and uh, and just go for it, man. Just uh, uh, it's never going to be. It's probably never going to be easy. Not if it's something worthwhile. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, 
just hang on to to plan a you know i i personally never had a plan b so <laughs> stay on plan a and uh, and sooner or later you know you you're going to get what you want in my opinion yeah. i think you have the best chance and plan a really it seems like when you immigrated here from italy to nazareth pennsylvania i'm a pennsylvania boy myself too so i have a lot of pride in being from the state um, but for yourself up in Nazareth, the speedway was close by. Prior to it being a speedway, it was obviously a dirt, a dirt track, right? And you talked about yes. your, you and your brother Aldo racing on that and kind of sneaking out and everything. Um, with that, what does that mean to you? I know, I know it's abandoned now, but what does that track mean to you? And what does it represent? Well, it represents everything. It represents uh, what, uh, you know, uh, gave us uh, an opportunity to, to, to begin, to start. Uh, I mean, uh, it's something that was almost God-given. When we mm -hmm. arrived, yeah. as I said, on a Thursday, on a Sunday, we find out there's a track. It was uh, during the summer in June. So season full swing. And in those days, uh, uh, I know that you visited. Apparently you visited up here. So you, Last weekend. you know where the location is and, yeah. and everything. Yeah. So the track that you saw is the mile track, mm -hmm. which was built uh, uh, you know, much later, I like, think in the 70s. Uh, but what we started on now is a shopping center. And there was an idea, was an idea the original with the fairgrounds, if you will. Sure. And fairgrounds, what, what the track was basically a horse track, you know, because you have a grandstand. And then that's where a lot of these half mile tracks were, you know, original horse tracks. And then uh, they started racing cars on them. Uh, again, uh, this was a grassroots of American racing. And um, and again, it was a blessing that it was right here, uh, right within walking distance for us. And um, we saw what was happening. And after attending, you know, races for a couple of years and so forth, uh, uh, you inform yourself, you, um, you know, you, uh, you, you make friends and, um, and then you start talking about it and you figure, well, you know what? The only way to get started is to just uh, roll up your sleeves yeah. and start doing it ourselves. You know, you, you couldn't buy a stock car, I don't think we sure as hell could not afford it. So, you know, uh, for us, uh, we didn't enter the uh, modified uh, class because that was way too expensive. Uh, ours was a sportsman class, but, um, you know, we started winning right away. You know, we had, uh, I had a, one, one of the four guys that uh, were part of our team uh, it was really pretty much uh, pretty uh, informed about uh, racing. He knew about NASCAR and everything else. He's the one that suggested uh, the car that we should build, something different than what they were racing here, which was probably the key factor. And we started building a Hudson, uh, 48 Hudson Hornet, and a specific chassis that we found in a junkyard. And then uh, we bought, uh, you know, racing engines that in fact we sold to a power com plant company in, in, uh, in Chicago. And uh, so anyway, we put this thing together and we bought information uh, from uh, Marshall Teague's team, which had been, uh, was folded as a factory team for Hudson at the time, but they had all the information and, uh, you know, uh, all total, I think we had uh, just a little over a thousand dollars invested in this thing. Yeah, and uh, and again, we made it happen. You know, uh, Aldo and I started. You know, we won the fir very first race that each one of us uh, competed in here. So it was a very auspicious beginning for us. Very encouraged, and um, from there, uh, I keep saying, you know, we did all the. All the things that race drivers do, we yeah. crack, we, we, <laughs> we finish second, we finish last, we, and all of that. So it almost really did seem like destiny with that track being there when you, you know, when you arrived. It was a destiny for us, you know, when yeah. I look back, what if, what if this one had been there? Mm -hmm. What if that one had been there? Uh, There's so many factors that just went together, but why? Only because we had that will to just pursue, to, to sure. just make something happen. Um, I always have a specific appreciation for any young person, you know, that uh, at the, an early age, they have a, 
uh, a path that they want to pursue, mm -hmm. uh, no matter what it is. But that's something very healthy because uh, that individual is going to be successful. Yeah. You know, the one thing that turns me off more than anything is a college student that comes off, uh, graduates, college, university, whatever. Well, you know, I, uh, I'm not sure exactly, you know, what I will pursue. Well, you know, good luck, man. Uh, and uh, it, like I said, it, it, it just uh, the, if there's a, that uncertainty, uh, you, you, you'll have a tougher time. But uh, if, you know, if you know early on in life uh, that uh, you have a passion for something, you're going to be successful. Yeah. You're going to love your life. And it sustains you too. Um, you know, I think through your career, for me personally, this podcast is keeping me sane throughout the COVID. Really enjoy doing it. It's a passion of mine. It's all about finding right. a passion. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit about your transition from stock car racing to open wheel racing and kind of talk about that a little bit and how you were able to make the flip, be successful and complications with that, if any. Well, you know, uh, my objective was uh, always to uh, to move all, move forward, move on. You know, like mm -hmm. uh, I looked at uh, my career, my profession is like going to school. You start at kindergarten, you know, then you go elementary school, and on and on. And, yeah. and we start in kindergarten with a stock car, and and um, as soon as possible, I want to get into open wheel single seaters. I wanted to get into the real thing, yeah. which I did. You know, we just, uh, we bought, I had uh, actually my, at that time, my future father-in-law that invested in a three-quarter midget, started racing <laughs> indoors in a three-quarter midget, won races there, won the biggest race of the season. And that earned me a ride into a full-size midget with the Mateka brothers. And, uh, and I won races there. I won, you know, the race is enough to propel me to the sprint cars. And the sprint cars, you know, that propel me to the champ cars, to the top level. Always in the back of my mind, however, you know, was uh, Formula One. Mm -hmm. uh, along the way, you know, that was um, very much uh, uh, interested in sports prototypes and uh, long distance races because uh, I wanted to hone my skills into road racing. And the best way to do it for me at the time, but definitely it was the long distance races where you get a a lot of seat time in those sure. days. Sure. I mean, uh, even 24 hour races were two drivers, not four, to yeah. take that four yeah. drivers, you know, and uh, and there you got a lot of seat time. So, uh, and that prepared me for Formula One. So, but again, going back to uh, the sequence, uh, the transition for me uh, was uh, not a specific problem mainly because that's what I wanted, you know, I wanted, so you just adapt. Sure. And uh, what I found that um, by adapting to the just different categories and so forth, helped me tremendously to widen my scope, my dimension about the dynamics of driving the different cars. Uh, and uh, of course uh, we were, I was right at the infancy of, uh, of aerodynamics, uh, downforce and so forth, especially on the single seaters. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so all of that, you know, was just uh, increasing my knowledge that helped me set up the cars, you know, to be able to, to get the results. Uh, so it, it's, it's just a, it's a process. It's a long process, but uh, if, and the best thing that I had riding with me was the curiosity. I was always curious about, um, you know, what's going on on the other top uh, disciplines. Uh, uh, I wanted to have the experience even in stock cars, you know, sure. that was not going to be my career, but I wanted to see what was going on there. And uh, I was fortunate enough to be with the uh, top team. I had a great relationship with Ford and, uh, and, you know, when I, when I wanted to do stock cars, you know, they, they put me with home and the mood in their factory team. And uh, that's what gave me the victory at the, uh, the Daytona 500. Yeah. Uh, along the way, as I said, you know, uh, they weren't all, you know, um, uh, successes. Uh, and, and you learn from failures too, of course. But uh, um, but when I had the opportunity to drive, you know, for Lotus, for instance, my first experience in Formula One, and then Ferrari, along the way, and in between, uh, they did a march. We realized what, uh, you know, it's, 
I guess it's second category uh, effort means. And then uh, realizing that if you're going to have any opportunity to really uh, get results, you got to be with top teams. And and I've been, again, I've been very, very lucky along the way to, to, uh, to make some right choices um, and, you know, make some mistakes along the way. But again, I have no regrets because mm -hmm. uh, in the big picture, um, overall, things uh, have been extremely positive. One thing I'm really interested in is I'm, I'm a travel enthusiast. I love traveling and as much as I possibly can. What was it like traveling the world in the 70s and 80s with Formula One? And is there any particular venues that you really enjoyed or places that you, you went to? <laughs> uh, we didn't have a GPS. We didn't have an iPhone, you know. <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, you know, to, make, to facilitate things, and I look back at uh, my at uh, World Atlas maps, you know, we just, uh, <laughs> I travel sometimes all by myself all over the sure. world. You know, I travel six continents. And, um, um, and, but uh, some of it was actually much better than today, you know, especially in the, uh, in the 70s where I um, took much, a lot of advantage of uh, Concord, for instance. Uh, yeah. I would tra travel Europe back and forth, like going from here to Chicago almost, you know. So um, that was, uh, and I had my own plane uh, where I would just, you know, uh, today, if I want to fly to Europe, I'd have to leave home probably three hours before my flight. I used to leave home here with my plane one hour before the flight out of yeah, JFK yeah. to go anywhere in Europe. And uh, sometimes even the Middle East, you know, so far, uh, I mean, in, you know, in, actually uh, in Asia. Uh, so, uh, I, I, you know, as I say, the travel is actually easier in, in so many ways. You can have this uh, security stuff and everything that you have to deal with today. Um, and believe it or not, I, uh, like I said, I had that pretty well uh, slicked up, you know, uh, to my advantage. Uh, so, um, uh, overall, I uh, look back and say, oh, my goodness, you know, uh, is. Um, as much as you know, uh, things should have improved because technology today, uh, as far as travel is concerned, uh, I don't think I could do today <laughs> what I did then. <laughs> you know, unless I would, you know, have, have my own, you know, my airplane to, to fly overseas. You know, like a, sure. I have one later on, but not earlier on in my career. So um, again, that's uh, and I had planes. You know, I I, I had my uh, First airplane in '68. Okay. But honestly, and uh, then that was not an extravagant move. That was just a tool that sure. I needed uh, to be able to do as much as I did. Because uh, uh, I mean, you know, some of the races, like uh, I would race, um, you know, uh, you know, in Europe uh, on Saturday, you know, like in Monza, the thousand Ks, and I'd be in, in Atlanta in an Indy car on Sunday and vice versa. You know, the first Grand Prix that I attended, to, I attempted to to have uh, my debut in Italy in 68 at Monza. And, but there was a, uh, the Hoosier 100, which was a, mm -hmm. a race for the championship uh, on the dirt track in Indianapolis on a Saturday. So I had to go, you know, I had to qualify on a Friday race come back here race on, on saturday and go back there on sunday but they my car was on the grid i had even qualifying friday i was still seventh on the grid with lotus and uh, and and they uh there was a protest they didn't let me start but nevertheless uh that, those were my movements you know i yeah. just uh, um i i used to race race and race yeah and you know one thing was, I want to bring up the, the 78 Grand Prix, the Dutch Grand Prix in 1978, being the last American to win an F1 race. Um, I personally see amongst my, my friends in their mid-20s, Formula One is getting a lot more popular, at least for, from you know, my perspective. Is there any reason why an American has not won a race since 78? You know, although many have tried their hand, what, what's, you know, what do you attribute to that? Well, the main thing that um, that I think uh, we can make sense on is the fact that uh, uh, our country, America, is probably the only country on the planet that has enough 
high level uh, motorsports, you know, categories or disciplines uh, that uh, you can have a perfectly wonderful career to satisfy yourself in every way without really going, you know, going abroad. Sure. And, uh, and I mean, and some of the individuals that probably have those dreams did not cultivate anything here to, to, to gain that, uh, uh, so, uh, that experience or, or like that notoriety to be uh, uh, potentially selected to, to try over there. So it, it's a difficult situation. It was difficult even when I broke in there. Luckily that um, I had that uh, developed this relationship with Colin Chapman mm -hmm. uh, at Indianapolis that, uh, uh, that, you know, he says, you know, Mario, whenever you're ready to do Formula One, uh, I'll have a car for you. God, I mean, you know, uh, there's nothing, nothing better you could ever said to me at the time, but uh, that doesn't happen every day. You know, there's a lot of young lads here that uh, I know one in particular, uh, Colton Herda, that uh, actually trained in Europe, you know, since age 15 and, um, and did extremely well. And uh, you can see what he's doing now in IndyCar. So mm -hmm. uh, he could be a uh, really a very strong candidate uh, to be in Formula One, but he's with a top team now where he can win. And unless you be called or invited there to be with a top team over there, I wouldn't even suggest him to go, you sure. know, to go with a, with a back marker, you know, he has no chance, you know, and then sometimes, uh, uh, you know, he probably won't be evaluated properly. I mean, look what happened to Judge Russell. Yeah. You know, you know how much stock he gained just by having that uh, opportunity, you know, to sub for uh, for Lewis uh, and and show what he could do with a car that's capable. I mean, yeah. uh, you know, if it wasn't for mistakes by the team, he had clearly won that race. And uh, and if, you know, with Mercedes and uh, clearly outperforming both us. Yeah. You know, so. Um, Again, how many of those talents are back there in Formula <laughs> yeah. One? Yeah. And but but you know, but that's nothing new. You know, Formula One was always like that because uh, you know you have each uh, each team has has got his own factory, his own you know this and that. And the fascinating part that I love about it too still is the fact that uh, even the, say the top three, if you look at any uh, grid. You know, they're probably separated by a, a tenth or, or two tenths of a second, you know, with a different design, different driver, different engine and so forth. And that, sure. that's it is, you know, that's that's what it is. It's uh, it's not a spec series and they never it never should be. Mm -hmm. But, you know, again, for a, a talent that's, uh, you know, that like. Going back to the question again, I'm rambling on. Oh, it's, that, it's great. You know, for for a real talent that I know could get the job done, uh, and I'm here with the top team where they can bring the results, mm -hmm. when they can win races, or win a championship, uh, they won't want to go over there and just be, you know, uh, with a with a back marker. That's what I'm so, saying. Yeah, yeah. And I would go over there when when I when when I uh, broke into Formula One. Uh, my first race, as you can see, was with the, one of the top teams, Lotus. Sure. Uh, my first race that I won in Formula One in 71, you know, uh, uh, three years later, uh, and they may, only had about five Formula One races under my belt, uh, I was with Ferrari. Here again, you know, top team. So uh, that's why, you know, going back to what I said, uh, uh, the the top talent, you know, unless you're invited by a top team, uh, you know, you're going to stay here. And fortunately, uh, these United States can provide, you know, some wonderful careers, mm -hmm. you know, whether stock cars or you know, sports prototypes or, um, or Indy cars for that matter, um, and be totally satisfied. It really is one of the best places to be or to be a racer. I mean, it's to, to truly well, grow up. The best yeah, place it, on earth. The best, to be yeah. A race driver for yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. No yeah. question, you know, but I'd love to see, you know, going back, I'd love to see uh, a, in Formula One, I think would prosper from having um, a, a top line, you know, uh, US driver uh, to represent our flag around the world uh, and, 
and um, with pride, I think it would do uh, wonders for Formula One because of, uh, you know, the, how vast our market mm-hmm. is and the sponsors and so forth. Uh, the fact that we have, um, you know, a world-class uh, uh, facility here with uh, Coda, you know, yeah. in Austin. Um, I think that speaks volumes for what the future of uh, Formula One uh, means here in America. So a, an American driver would do, um, you know, would be wonderful, would be great, you know, if, uh, to advance uh, and build on the, the fan base that uh, the U.S. is already enjoying. Already have, yeah, I, I really agree. Um, the other side of racing, endurance racing, you know, a couple more questions before we wind down. Um, Lamont, can you speak a little bit about that? I know, I know you competed last in 2000. Um, just, kind of, just kind of just the, the spectacle that it is and just, just your experience with the I, race. I, yeah, I loved Le Mans. I yeah. really I loved driving Le Mans. For some reason, I did a lot of crashing there. I don't know why. <laughs> I'm, usually not, I'm usually not a crasher, you know, but uh, I did my share of it there. But um, I also had some decent results. I think, uh, you know, I can claim a win in Le Mans, you know, class win. It was not overall, second sure. overall, but should have been first overall. A lot of things happened to us during that, you know, that race. But uh, uh, you know, to have had the opportunity to race a couple of times with uh, uh, my son Michael, you know, yeah. as a teammate, uh, and also with my nephew John in '88 with the three of us, three and uh, with a factory Porsche. Um, you know, uh, Michael and I uh, and. Uh, and Hillary, we finished third uh, uh, in 1983, I think it was, uh, with, the, with the Porsche. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, Le Mans, you know, meant a great deal. I love, sure. just love, love driving there. Sure. And uh, I drove that, uh, when I drove the old circuit, you know, in 1966, uh, before they, uh, you know, bypass, uh, the, I don't know, it was one area was very dangerous to build. They, the, the uh, Porsche curves and so forth. And uh, there were some changes there, but uh, uh, overall, again, I just, um, uh, I just literally always look forward to going there for sure. Only did it nine times because it, it usually interfered with some of the other races that I had going, but, uh, uh, but uh, regardless, I always, uh, I, f- I felt great about going back. Yeah. Yeah. And that was your last race there was in 2000. Since then, what have you been up to? I mean, any business ventures? Uh, you know, I, I know you, you love wine. If you can talk a little bit about that. What's what's uh, Mario Andretti up to? It's been 20 years. Well, it, it <laughs> would've been, you know, we got a lot of things. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, right now we cultivated it um, since the mid nineties, uh, a petroleum business mm-hmm. on the West Coast, uh, California, Oregon, uh, a little bit of Washington, uh, in the West, and uh, that, that's developed into a, a, I think, a meaningful business for us. Um, you know, we had dealership, auto dealerships, which uh, you know we had, we progressed and sold, and uh, and as I mentioned, the winery. You know, that, that's been uh, very interesting. You know, it's something. Uh, there's a romance to that, to that yeah. type of business, obviously. Sure. Uh, and we enjoy it and be proud of that part. Um, we have uh, these um, uh, facilities, uh, go-kart, primarily go-kart facilities, but we call it, it's an overall family entertainment facility mm-hmm. called the Andretti Karting and Games. We have five of those going and uh, six one being built. And the objective is to build two or three a year. Um, we're basically right now in uh, Georgia, Texas and Florida, but uh, we're expanding uh, on something like that. And uh, and we're very proud of uh, what's going on on that side. So, you know, we, we have plenty of stuff going on, believe me. Uh, and uh, that, that's what keeps us busy. That, that's what keeps us engaged. And uh, I wouldn't have it any other way. And you're still driving fast too, right? Are you, was... Yeah, enough to drive fast. I mean, actually, <laughs> Right there, that's my the two seater that I drive, yeah. uh, you know, and in uh, at the uh, in the events and so forth, awesome. and uh, I enjoy that very much, as you can imagine. Sure. Um, yeah, it's 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 a great thing for me. So 
we'll keep going on that as long as we can. And my last question for you is as someone who is kind of getting more into, you know, you know, my, 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 my mid twenties, the world of racing, you know, um, starting to really pick up on the sport. What would you recommend just, just watching, you know, open wheel stock car as much as you can. Are there any, what would you recommend for someone who's just getting into the sport? Well, here again, uh, just how badly do you really want to? You know, do you, uh, well, of what, you want to make this a career? As a view, excuse me, more as a viewer, as a viewer, not necessarily a driver, as oh, a viewer. As a viewer, what would I recommend? Yeah, just oh. to, to be educated on the sport and, uh, you know, more or less someone like myself in their mid-20s who just recently really started picking up on, on the sport. Well, yeah. you know, basically... Uh, like I said, the, our, uh, the top of our sport is exposed very well, and it's mm -hmm. good to educate yourself uh, in all of the top categories, you know, the top disciplines. And uh, there's plenty of action, of course, uh, with NASCAR, IndyCar, and then, and I think IMSA and the sports car, they really have a great TV program coming out, I mean, uh, for next year. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that's got uh, some interesting stuff going on with the, a lot of uh, the top drivers that uh, are recognizable, of course, like Jimmy Johnson, even yeah, yeah. Uh, trying to you know get in there and and uh, and, and and make his case. Uh, so we got Jimmy Johnson coming into IndyCar, uh, you know, especially on the road race, specifically on the road races, uh, and the talent that you have going on, both uh, young talent in NASCAR and IndyCar at, at this point is probably. Uh, like never before, you know, oh, so much yeah. interest going there to watch. So uh, as a viewer, again, you know, there's plenty, plenty to, uh, to look, for, look forward to. And, uh, and then it's good to be able to evaluate, the, you know, and learn about the, uh, what's going on in strategies and everything sure. else. I think that's always an interesting part of the sport to be able to enjoy fully, to understand what the strategies are all about. You know, the fuel consumption, you know, all those things that uh, mm -hmm. make a difference. And um, and each each series has something different to, to provide. So, um, yeah, uh, I love to see race fans that uh, actually uh, open up, turn the TV on for all of the majors, not just sure. in one category. Sure. Well, that's Mario, what I do. That's what I do. And, and that's what I'm trying to do, too. So just to hear from you kind of reinforces already what I've, what I've been trying and, to do. And... and don't miss MotoGP. <laughs> MotoGP too? Okay. I love, yeah. I love MotoGP. You see it on, um, yeah, on ABC, SN, you see that they have that now and, yeah. and it's, uh, it's amazing to watch. So um, again, there's plenty, plenty to watch, plenty to be uh, entertained by for sure. Well, I was really entertained by our conversation this past half an hour or so. And I really, really enjoyed having you on the show, Mario. I really appreciate it. Good luck to you, my friend. No, thank you, and take care. Thanks. Good luck here, pursue. Once again, that was Mario Andretti. If you enjoyed today's interview with Mario Andretti, please subscribe to my other channel, Good Luck Brian, where I journey to the abandoned Nazareth Speedway in Nazareth, Pennsylvania. If you would like to check out more content from the SBR podcast, please remember to follow me on Twitter and Instagram at the handle at SBR underscore podcast. We are, of course, active on YouTube at Sports Business Review. Don't forget to subscribe. Give us a follow on Facebook and LinkedIn at Sports Business Review. If you feel the need to provide any further feedback or you'd like to be featured on an episode, please visit www.sportsbusinessreview.com, the official home of the SBR podcast. Once again, my name is Brian McDonough, and drive safe, everyone.